You are listening to the Everything You Want to Know About Therapy But We're Too Afraid to Ask podcast with your hosts, Jennifer Trevelli and co-host Jessica Strang. If you ever wanted to start therapy but didn't know where to begin, you've come to the right place. In this podcast, we will offer a Therapy 101 by interviewing experts in the field and asking them anything and everything you wanted to know about therapy before you make your first appointment. Dr. David Carbonell is a clinical psychologist who specializes in helping people overcome fears, phobias, and worry. He's the author of four self-help books, including The Worry Trick, Fear of Flying Workbook, and Outsmart Your Anxious Brain, 10 Simple Ways to Beat the Worry Trick. He is a coach of the popular self-help site, anxietycoach.com, and has taught workshops on the treatment of anxiety disorders to more than 10,000 therapists in the U.S. and abroad. Dr. Carbonell received his doctorate in clinical psychology from DePaul University in 1985 and has maintained a private practice devoted to the treatment of anxiety disorders in Chicago since 1990. In his spare time, he's a founding member of the Therapy Players, an improvisational comedy troupe of professional psychotherapists in the Chicagoland area, and they have an upcoming show in Skokie, Illinois on April 2nd. The second edition of his book, Panic Attacks Workbook, was released in March 2022. We are so excited to have him on the show today. Dr. Dave Carbonell, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Welcome, welcome. We're excited to to chat with you today. Oh, I God, will I've been say looking that do it yeah and, and so have we we have <laughs> yes. technical issues in the past but we've got it together today and one of the things I do want to say is that um I, I did Jennifer knows this but I, I am a big fan I went to one of your conferences and uh, I really do enjoy your website um but before we start talking about the work that you're doing now presently um when did you begin studying psychology when was the the first time that you had an inclination this might be a path that you want to go on you know, I, I was kind of a late bloomer as far as psychology goes. This this is a second career. Um, I worked in uh, public administration for a number of years, I think, until, uh, oh, what? Uh, I, I was in my early 30s. Wow. And, okay. uh, yeah, so I, I, I was working in, in, in Springfield at the time, Springfield, Illinois. I, I grew up uh, in New York, but... Uh, I got a master's in public administration, got recruited to be in the, uh, the governor's bureau of the budget and worked my way through a number of state agencies. And, and it seemed like the, the, the further I progressed in that career, the less I liked it. <laughs> oh, oh, my goodness. I, I wonder how that felt, too, because, you know, you, you, you invest time, effort and, and education in that. Um, what was that feeling oh, like to, 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 uh, to know you don't like it? <laughs> well, it, it was really unsettling, um, you know, and, and it. it uh, it, it took me a, a good long while to uh, see the writing on the wall and realize, well, you, okay, you got to make some kind of a change here. You're, you're, you're too young to stay in the field that, that mm-hmm. you're not. Enjoying. Um, and this was so uh, what the early eighties. Uh, and at the time, the, uh, the, the big thing for people, you know, career changing what was just starting to come into vogue at that point you know in my mm-hmm. parents generation nobody changed careers you got a job you held on to it mm-hmm. um, and the, the the big touchstone for career changing at that time was this book called uh, what color is your parachute i think it's still out in, in publication <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. it's an edition or something but mm-hmm. that was that was the bible for career changers and so i i got that book and i worked it and I went out and interviewed people in other professions and did everything they said and I had all these career tests, preference tests and so on. And uh, at the end of it, um, what, what uh, everything seemed to indicate was, well, you're either going to become a, a psychologist or a comedian. <laughs> oh, oh wait. Okay, I can't wait. I can't wait to hear because that was I, what I, got. I know. Yeah, that's, 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 okay, yeah. Uh, and and so, well, at the time, I thought, well, being a comedian really means you're driving a cab most nights. Um, <laughs> so I decided I'll, I'll 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 go with psychology and see if I can't work the comedy in somewhere. <laughs> and that, that's how I uh, uh, 
came, came to, you know, enter the field of psychology. And at, at that time, well, I, I didn't have a psych undergraduate major. I didn't have any uh, psychology classes behind me. Uh, I took a number of classes at night school at, at the uh, University of Illinois just to get to a point where they would accept my application for grad school, you know, where I had mm -hmm. classes to qualify as a major. Um, gee, there was another point I was going to make there. And what was it? It just passed my mind. Um, oh, oh, I know. Uh, I, I had already racked up a number of years in, in higher education. So I thought, well, you know what, before you sign on for another four or five, um, try it out. And so I worked at uh, Chicago Lakeshore, which at that time was, and maybe they still are, had a unit for hospital, hospital unit for uh, depressed and acting out adolescents. Hmm, and so okay. I, I worked there as an orderly, basically, for a year uh, just to try and see, okay, is this something you really want to do? And at the end of the year, I still felt like, yeah, this is what I want to do. So that, that's when I went to grad school. Um, and I ended up at DePaul because uh, I wanted to stay in Chicago. And I think I graduated in 85. And that, that was my entree to becoming a psychologist. Wow. I mean, it's, it's definitely, I would say, when Jessica and I started grad school, we um, we were probably two of the younger people in our class, and it did seem mm -hmm. like quite a few of our classmates was a second career for them moving into graduate school in the field of psychology. So I don't I don't think you're alone in that area. Um, but it's definitely uh, definitely seems like a second career for a lot of people in this field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably not alone. I, I was certainly the oldest student at the time. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, that was kind of fun in a way. I, I, I think I, I, I was more clear about what I wanted to do. And mm -hmm. so I, 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 I kind of blazed through the program. Um, but yeah, most of the people at DePaul, there were a couple people that have were, had maybe two years of work experience in between undergrad and graduate. Other, otherwise they, they were just going straight through, but in any event, um, that's how I got here. So can you um, tell us a little bit more about what you currently do, kind of what your current position is, what your role is today? Uh, well, today um, I'm uh, in private practice. I, I work exclusively with clients presenting anxiety disorders, fears, phobias, generalized anxiety disorder, uh, uh, still OCD, even though that's move and move now and into another category. Um, social anxiety disorder, panic disorder. That that's that's been my practice for oh gosh since 1990. Um, and uh, I don't see nearly as many clients now as I used to uh, because I'm I'm starting to move towards cutting back a little bit and uh, retiring. But I I see maybe 15 clients a week right now. Uh, and as I say, it's, it's all in that area of, of people seeking help with various fears and phobias. And in addition to that work that you mm -hmm. do, I mean, I, I came to know you through your work as uh, a speaker um, towards, you know, teaching other uh, psychologists and, and mental health professionals uh, getting their continuing education <clears throat> credits. Um, how did you get into that? Um, that was with PESI and I, I, gee, mm -hmm. I did those workshops so well, probably about 15 years worth. Um, you know, how, how I got into that uh, was um, sometime right around the turn of the, the century, um, my wife and I took a vacation out east and we saw a bed and breakfast and on our vacation and we decided, you know what, Let, let's get a bed and breakfast. And, and so we like, like, get, like buy one, like buy one, <laughs> buy one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, okay, I thought you meant just go to one. <laughs> no, 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 no. Wow. We we bought one. Yeah. So we come home from vacation and people, oh, how was your vacation? Oh, good. We we bought a bed and breakfast uh, in, in New York State, a, a thousand miles from here. Uh, and and so after a while, we you know we we moved in and we ran the bed and breakfast for a few years, 
and long, long way to explain how I came to do PESI. Um, I, I had the idea that, well, I'll, I'll establish a practice uh, out here on Long Island. It was on the very east end of Long Island. Um, and the area was so rural, I found it very, very hard to establish a practice. Ooh, okay. um, you know, not nearly enough to sustain us. And so I, mm-hmm. I, I was looking for other things to do and, and uh, uh, offering workshops, you know, it was one thing that came up. And so I, I got in touch with PESI and, and uh, they were interested in having me do some workshops. And that's how I got started with it. And I love the workshop that you had done. It was about anxiety, of course. And, and just for people that don't know that are listening, PESI is an organization that does continuing education for professionals. Perpe- Sorry, I'm a little tongue tied <laughs> Professionals just like me and Jennifer. And so we take these courses to continue to learn as we do after we graduate, because just having our degrees isn't enough. So there's mm-hmm. seminars and conferences and, and yours is quite popular. Mm-hmm. And so um, that's one of the reasons why I wanted to contact you. And I guess my, my main question, you know, regarding your work with Pessy and regarding the work that you're currently doing is what made you become interested in anxiety? Well, you know, I, I, I just kind of fell into it. Um, I, I did my, uh, my internship at, at Heinz Veterans Hospital. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. And uh, right, right from the get-go, well, there, you know, my, my, even, even some of my practicums, um, my supervisors would remark on it and say things to the effect of, well, you, you, you seem to do better with anxious clients than anybody else. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you kind of have a thing for it. Uh, whatever, I, I got that feedback. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, these other areas are not so good, but anxiety do very well. <laughs> Uh, so, well, okay, that's, you know, that, that's good. I, I enjoy doing it. Uh, people are getting better. And this, this was 1985, um, just when uh, all the, <clears throat> the, the CBT work, the um, empirically uh, based therapies, David Barlow, uh, all that was coming to the fore. And prior to that, you know, if, if you had panic disorder and agoraphobia, God help you, there, there was really no help available. Uh, no, nothing that was going to be very useful. And then suddenly in the mid 80s, uh, these methods became available and, and anxiety was everywhere on the media, on Oprah and you know, mm-hmm. panic disorder suddenly became uh, the, the topic of the day, whereas before it had just been, you know, this deep, dark secret. And so I came to realize, oh, gosh, there's a lot of people out there looking for help uh, mm-hmm. and, and they can't find it. And I'm, I'm good at this thing and I like doing it. And so, well, I, uh, all right, let's do that. Uh, and, and so I, I just kept saying yes to, you know, what, what was being presented to me. And that, that's how I, I went into the anxiety specialty. Wow. It's, it's definitely something that the need for anxiety work has not gone away through the years. No, no. <laughs> you know, every five years, people think, well, surely it's going to crest and and, and fade and let's see what the next thing is yeah. and really i think it, it's it's been anxiety disorders uh as long as i've been practicing since since the the 90s it's still the number one presenting problem mm-hmm. today mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. absolutely and i know while mo- most people who are listening know uh-huh. what anxiety is we we it's something that we all experience anxiety in some form um, but can you explain a little bit more about what anxiety is? Oh, well, ang- anxiety uh, a- a- as a term, you know, denotes a whole bunch of internal experiences. Uh, um, anxiety symptoms come in, in several different varieties. Uh, anxious thoughts. What if this or that happens to me? Uh, anxious uh, physical sensations. Um where, you know, my heart does something unusual, or I feel tense in my muscles and tight and uncomfortable, or I have trouble catching my breath or feeling lightheaded. Uh, There's anxious emotions. Um, And there's, there's behaviors too. uh, Behavior is another way people experience anxiety, Uh, tensing up, fleeing the scene, not talking. Um, So that there's a variety of ways that uh, anxiety can be uh, expressed symptomatically, um, what unifies it probably is is a pervasive kind of sense that um, a pervasive sense of vulnerability. 
uh, and, and difficulty coping that leads people to, to retreat, remove, inhibit themselves. That's, you know, large or small, uh, uh, severe or mild, that's a general description of how, how people experience anxiety. And, and uh, to follow up on that, because it is something that, you know, you and Jennifer and I know, but um, is anxiety normal? And, and is it normal, number one? And then when is it not? Because I think that's the big question why mm -hmm. many people at least come to see me is because they don't realize that some of the uh, symptoms that you had just described could be problematic, could be normal. And so discerning between those <laughs> is, is usually the work that we do in the beginning. But, you know, for you to kind of catch us all up to speed, you know, when is it normal? When is it not? Well, certainly, you know, um, much anxiety, much of anxiety is, is, is normal and ordinary and to be expected. Um, and and uh, in the general population, pe people generally underestimate that um, because they look around, they, they look at their peers, they look at their friends, they, they look at their neighbors and, and they don't see much of anything that they recognize as anxiety. And they mm -hmm. compare that to what they feel internally, you know, through their own nerve endings. And they formulate the, the opinion, oh, my God, I'm so much more anxious than all, my, all the people around me. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they, they compare the, the, the outward physical appearance of others with their own internal sensations. And it's no comparison. So they end up feeling like, uh, I'm terribly anxious, but, you know, I'm, I'm probably the most anxious person in the tri-state area. Uh, <laughs> and most people feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that really distorts their sense of, of, of what's ordinary and, and what's not, because um, for the most part, they, they can't directly observe it in others. And for the most part, people uh, at least, you know, didn't, it, it's, it's less true now, talk about it at all. So, uh, somebody who, who had a strong sense of anxiety felt really isolated and, and uh, unusual. Um, what what makes anxiety actually unusual or, or troublesome? You know, when does it, it shift, say, from an anxiety, from feeling anxiety, which is ordinary and usual, that's what keeps us alive, you know, alerts mm -hmm. us to danger. Um, what makes that, uh, what, what, what trans transitions from ordinary anxiety to an anxiety disorder? Uh, a, a couple of things. People feel uh, so burdened and oppressed by the anxiety that it, it begins to interfere with their their daily functioning, their job, their school, their home. You know, however they uh, they they live their place in life, and typically they get caught up in uh, a battle, a struggle against the anxiety so that that's what makes it an anxiety disorder it's interfering with my daily activities <laughs> and I'm, I'm fighting so much to be less anxious that's an anxiety disorder and so you might see uh, somebody who has, has panic attacks <clears throat> uh, strong sudden outbursts of, of physical <laughs> fear uh, accompanied by the idea, oh my God, I'm going to have some kind of a breakdown. I'm going to lose mm -hmm. control of myself. I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to have a heart attack and die. I'm going to uh, randomly attack strangers on the street. Um, and they, they begin to feel so vulnerable and dangerous that they avoid anything that they associate with anxiety. So if they had a first panic attack on the highway, they stopped driving on the highway. If it was on an airplane, they don't fly anymore. Uh, if it was, you know, in a crowded mall, they just start going to little ma and pa stores. Um, so then that, that's how people's lives get disrupted, you know, with, with in that particular instance by lots of avoidance. Mm -hmm. And that's something I think, you know, we definitely, we definitely see and, and hear <coughs> about. Um, and I know a lot of times people will talk, and you mentioned panic attacks, people will talk about panic attacks. Is there a difference, and they'll, they'll mention and talk about having an anxiety attack. Is there a difference between a panic attack and an anxiety attack? Are mm. they the same thing? Is, can you shed some light on that for us? Well, you know, you know the, it, it's unfortunate. Um, th these aren't really well standardized terms. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you think as a field, we would have this much nailed. 
um, but we don't. Right. Um, you you will hear people refer to anxiety attacks, mm-hmm. um, and and I can tell you how I differentiate them. And I, I think this is probably a majority opinion, but you'll hear plenty of uh, people you know use it differently. Uh, for me, the key is: are we talking about uh, an attack? If we're talking about an attack, whether the person calls it panic or anxiety. Uh, to me, that indicates this short, abrupt um, peak experience where uh, my uh, physical sensations and o- other manifestations of anxiety very rapidly go from zero to 100, uh, and it freaks me out, and it doesn't last very long. That's uh, a panic attack, mm-hmm. and if somebody tells me they're having an anxiety attack, I think of it the same way. Uh, whereas if somebody tells me they're having trouble with anxiety, what that usually means to me is higher levels of ordinary, of ordinary anxiety, which persist for a significant period of time, days, weeks maybe, um, never peaking nearly as high as a panic attack, never quite giving rise to those fears that say, I'm about to lose control of myself or die or go crazy right here, right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anxiety is more about, oh, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but pretty soon I'm going to have some really, really bad trouble that I can't handle. Uh, It's this more cloud over your head that's maybe at 50 feet instead of right on your scalp. Uh, that's, That's what I think of as anxiety. And then so you know, represented principally by, say, what we call generalized anxiety disorder, where somebody has lots of worries and, and vague physical sensations that tell them mm, something bad is coming. It's not here now, like it is with a panic attack, but it's coming, and I'm really distraught about it. You know, you, you bring up a really great point about, you know, the, the anxiety and, and differentiating between the anxiety attacks and panic attacks. And, mm-hmm. and, and of course, when someone does experience, if you've ever experienced what I have experienced a panic attack in my lifetime, um, it's, it's overwhelming and it feels terrible. And mm-hmm. I think in general, when most people come to see me um, and they come in with anxiety and or panic attacks, um, you know, they say they, they don't want any anxiety in their life. And you had brought up a point earlier that we need it to, to be you know, alive and normal. And so could, could you talk about that? Because one of our, our listener questions that we had um, come in was, can I take my anxiety away completely? I don't want it anymore. Can you, can you speak to that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, short and sweet, the only people with no anxiety are dead people. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, to aspire to. Uh, so the, yeah, so the short answer is no. Um, uh, it's understandable, you know, when, when somebody's struggling this much and feels so oppressed, that of course they want to get rid of that. And they, mm-hmm. they, they think of it as a disease, some kind of invasive process. Um, but the, the, the truth is an anxiety disorder, uh, is an overblown, uh, overbearing version of ordinary anxiety, and, and we need ordinary anxiety uh, by which to live, to cross the street safely, you know, to remember to uh, pay our taxes before they seize our home, uh, to do all those kinds of ordinary things. So uh, that, that's the tricky bit, that you want to get the anxiety, you know, back to ordinary proportions, uh, but not to get involved in, in this overweening struggle, I have to get anxiety out of my life because, um, well, the, the harder you fight against anxiety, guess what? The more mm-hmm. anxious you're going to become. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Way, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. it definitely does. Um, yeah, so or- that, that's, that's the tricky bit, help, mm-hmm. helping people find that, that sense of proportion. Absolutely. And I think it's something that does you know, it, 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 people have to, you sometimes have to figure out, is this, you know, am I having too much anxiety? <clears throat> or there are some people who say, you know, there are never, we had another listener question who said, I'm never not worrying. Mm-hmm. Is that normal? Mm-hmm. Is it normal to have kind of this kind of overhanging cloud of worry happening? Yeah. Is it normal? Um <sighs> Uh, 
Oh, I don't even like using the term so much because <laughs> it, it carries so much baggage, but um, it isn't something that people have to experience. Uh, I, I, I think if you're worried all the time, um, there's every reason to think that, gee, I could perhaps find ways to have less worry in my life. Uh, you know, people who, who can see, gee, I, 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 I seem to be worrying excessively um, are probably caught up in a, in, in a pattern where uh, characteristically they, they over worry and, and repeatedly worry and can learn how to rein that in. Uh, which again, not, not to say that they don't get the ordinary amount of worry. It's just that, you know, wor worry has a function. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it reminds me to do something. It reminds me to t take care of something. And ideally, uh, I get the reminder, oh, maybe I, maybe I postpone, maybe I blow it off. It comes along and taps me on the shoulder again, reminds me a few times, and I go do it. Uh, and then I stop worrying about that task. Somebody with generalized anxiety disorder they keep worrying about stuff that doesn't even require doing. Uh, so they, they have a, a, a different, a different process to go through. When, when it comes to worrying, um, can you tell us more about how that works in, let's say a disorder like obsessive compulsive disorder and, and explain maybe to the audience that doesn't know what, what that disorder is about. If you, if you don't mind explaining a little bit about that. Sure. Um, well, obsessive compulsive disorder is, is uh, you know, probably the, the strongest version of worry that we can think about. Um, and, and, and somebody with, with, with OCD, uh, you know, the, the classic picture of OCD is someone experiences uh, obsessive thoughts, you know, and by that is meant they're repetitive, they're persistent, you can't seem to dismiss them. Uh, the, the kind of thought that most people have when they go off to the airport, they're on their way to a, a luxury vacation somewhere and you get half a mile from the house and you wonder, did I turn off the, the coffee pot? Mm -hmm. Did I turn off the coffee pot? And, 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 and some people will have to go home and, and check to see that the coffee pot is off. That's an example of an obsessive thought. Uh, and the, the compulsive part is when it, it seems to the individual um, this thought I'm having is so bad, it, it portends such bad things, or it's just so unacceptable to me to have this thought that I have to do something to get rid of it. And, and so mm. the person, the person going to the airport will go home, walk in the house, look at the car, it's off, maybe they'll fiddle with the, the switch, maybe they'll unplug it and say, now I damn well know it's not on, mm -hmm. uh, now let's go to Europe. That, that's mm -hmm. the Somebody with OCD is going to experience those obsessive thoughts and engage in the compulsions to the nth degree. Um, and, and so here you, you, we're talking about, you know, in, in uh, classical illustrations of this, someone who, who's concerned by thoughts, did I get something bad on my hands? You know, when I walked by the hospital, could I have... I passed a trash can that I accidentally get poked with a, a needle with some infectious material on it. I don't remember that, but what if I didn't notice? And th this thought oppresses them so much, even mm -hmm. though they, they may well have good reason to understand, you know, this is a wild and wacky thought. I don't really think that happened, but what if it did? Um, all right, well, let's be safe. Uh, let's go back and look at the garbage bail. Uh, and, and they'll look at the garbage bill and, oh, there doesn't appear to be a needle. Um, and, and maybe go through all kinds of machinations about that. Or, or did I get some, some infectious material from someplace else, a bathroom? Uh, uh, I used to say public telephone, but we don't have public <laughs> telephones anymore. Yeah, yeah no, um, no, we don't actually. I just yeah, show my right. that, by the way, in a movie, they're like, what is that? And I'm like, oh, boy. So <laughs> yeah, what is, what is that thing you put, you put your finger in there? What? Um, so, so they might have the idea. I, I, I picked up some terrible contamination from the, the, the phone. Um, uh, next thing they, you know, they're washing their hands and, and with, with obsessions, Oh, well, once is not enough. You know, as we all know, don't we? Gee, I washed my hands. Did I really get everything? Well, let's be sure. 
next thing you know, we got somebody who's washing their hands to the point where they, they, they start getting red and, and bloody. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in extreme cases, they might spend uh, 45 minutes in the bathroom trying to wash their hands. Uh, 45 minutes trying to park their car so that it's perfectly parallel in order to get rid of that thought. Well, what if I park my car mm-hmm. carelessly and something bad happens? So really extreme thoughts. They, they try so hard to get rid of them and shut them up and get rid of them. They can't. And they go and do something to get rid of the thought. And now they become a prisoner. They have to keep doing these things in order to hold the thoughts at bay. It, it, it's a, a terrible problem. But that that's sort of the extreme of, of worrisome thoughts. Um, and, generalized and, and, anxiety disorder is kind of a, it, it's similar to that, but it's milder. It doesn't quite have the same uh, compulsive behaviors and the strength of the thoughts isn't necessarily the same. But, um, you know, in both cases, it's people having unpleasant thoughts that, that seem to suggest something bad is going to happen. And, and they get into a struggle with them, trying to reassure themselves that it's going to be OK. And to your earlier point is, um, you know, talking a little bit about when it becomes problematic and something that is an issue in your life. So for example, like it stops you from function, normal functioning. Mm-hmm. I think you illustrated beautifully, you know, parking that car a bunch of times, you know, or washing your hands to the point where, um, you know, that you, they're, you're there for an hour. Um, good indications of this being problematic versus did I turn off the coffee pot? I've got one foot out the door. I can turn, go turn around and look at it and see that it's off. Mm-hmm. And it's going. Um, mm-hmm. So, so what would you say would be then the best form of treatment for something like OCD? Uh, well, for, for OCD and, and uh, uh, similarly for most of the anxiety disorders, uh, uh, you know, uh, current thinking is that the, the best treatment is what's called exposure and response prevention. Uh, a formidable sounding term. It sure um, but is, what it, yeah. yeah. Um, but what it means is uh, uh, the exposure is, um, well, I'm going to go uh, use that public telephone or whatever the 21st century equivalent is. I'm going to uh, go and throw something in the garbage pail and touch the top of the garbage pail. I'm going to pull up to the curb and park the car and, and uh, do what seems best and I'm not going to back up or look around and I'm not going to look at the car again as I walk into the house. Um, I'm going to expose myself to these situations where it appears as though, oh, something could be going wrong. Uh, and I'm going to engage in response prevention. And so the response prevention for the parking is I am not going to go and look at the parking job I did, nor am I going to walk out there and move the car again. I'm going to go in the house and go on and do what I uh, was going to do. And I'm going to have those thoughts and I'm just going to say, well, okay, come hella high water. I parked the car, uh, let the chips fall where they may. Uh, and, and similarly with, you know, with handling items and having the thoughts of contamination all across the board, I'm, I'm going to experience the anxiety and I'm not going to pay what really amounts to the blackmail of going and engaging in those compulsions. Uh, and I'm going to let the anxiety subside. Uh, and that's the, the best form of treatment we have for OCD. Um, and it's a very hard form of treatment at mm-hmm. times. Um, but but that is the, the state of the art treatment. I was going to say, it definitely doesn't sound like it would be something mm-hmm. that would be easy to do if you're experiencing mm-hmm. some of those <clears throat> obsessive thoughts and the compulsions. No, no, it, it can be quite uncomfortable. Um, now, you know, it does work. You know, people move mm-hmm. in the right direction and they see that. Um, but I, I would say above all the anxiety disorders, treatment of OCD probably involves more discomfort than, than any of the others. I'm trying to think of some other examples of what, what people are up against with OCD. Sometimes you'll see people with... Uh, full cycle of they have clearly defined obsessive thoughts and clearly defined compulsive behaviors. So I, I, I have the thought I, I might have gotten, you know, bad germs on my hand, or maybe I mishandled the insecticide in the garage, and then the repeated washing. That, that's clear mm-hmm. obsession and compulsion. 
sometimes um, you'll uh, work with people who have what, what's called uh, pure O, pure obsessive. Oh. Um, they don't have any uh, observable behavioral compulsions. Uh, they still have compulsions, but the compulsions take place in their minds. So here we're going to see people who have um, uh, unpleasant or scary thoughts. Uh, let's see if I can think of an example. Um, uh, well, so, you know, uh, he's right arm and, and uh, uh, doing antisocial and, and criminal things. Uh, uh, what, what if I've harmed somebody? What if I've sabotaged someone's car? Um, you know, what, what if I attacked a child in the playground? You know, thoughts of doing terrible things. Um, and then they engage in mental rituals uh, to try and prove to themselves that they didn't do that. So they don't do anything behaviorally there isn't the physical equivalent of the washing of the hands uh they're continuing continually opposing the thoughts and trying to satisfy themselves no i didn't do that um and that that's what's called pure O, because all the operations are within their mind as compared to i go over to the sink and i wash my hands or i go out and i move the car again really interesting mm -hmm. yep absolutely and i think it's something that I mean, with, with anxiety in general, I feel like in society and media and TV shows and movies, it's something that there doesn't see as, there doesn't seem to be as much stigma attached to anxiety as some of the other um, mental health disorders. And kind of, especially along with OCD, a lot of times you'll see characters on TV shows portrayed with OCD. Another one that I think is, is also kind of common in having people talk about it. It's more of a, can at times be more of a layperson term is phobias. Can you talk to us a little bit about what a phobia is and what kind of, how it differentiates just from being afraid of something? Sure. Um, well, uh, when we talk about a phobia, we're, we're talking about, uh, you know, what, what's called an irrational fear, uh, meaning that, the individual with the phobia generally knows, at least most of the time, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, I'm more afraid of this than I have to be. Um, I'm more avoidant of this than I have to be. I, I, I would like to overcome this somehow. Uh, so um, nobody has a phobia for uh, climbing into the lion cage at Brookfield Zoo. Uh, it's good to be afraid of climbing into the lion cage. That, that, that's not a phobia. Um, maybe the person have... with a pure O has that, but maybe not the phobia. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's a different category. <laughs> right. uh, uh, so, with, with, you know, pe people who uh, are afraid to fly, uh, fear of flying, a phobia for flying on commercial aircraft, uh, afraid of driving, um, afraid of public speaking. Uh, afraid of shopping in crowded stores, all manner of, of phobias. And by phobia, we mean they, they have uh, sufficiently intense fear that it leads them to change their behavior, uh, that they either avoid the object or the activity of the situation, or they only approach it under certain conditions which they feel offers them some protection. Uh, so... You might have a person who's just completely phobic for driving. They don't. They don't drive at all. Um, most driving phobics do some driving. They're they're more specialized. It's very common to see people who you know, can drive on local roads, but I can't get onto the divided highways. Or maybe I can drive in a local road, but I, I feel the need to stay in the right hand lane. As long as I can be in the right hand lane, I'm okay. I don't think I can handle the middle lane, or God forbid, the left hand lane. Um, so you see a lot of this I can do, this I can't do, uh, which works because inherently the phobia is, is illogical, irrational, all those words we use to, to mean um, it predicts danger that tends not to occur. And uh, what so are some that, of the that, top phobias? I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Dave. So no, that, that, I was just summing up that that's what a phobia would be, uh, the fear and the, the avoidance or perhaps some other kind of protective behavior. And what would you uh, consider some of the top <clears throat> phobias that you've seen in your experience um, uh, of people coming in to see you? What are the, uh, the more popular ones? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Um, 
it, it varies, uh, though the most frequently occurring phobia of all is believed to be the fear of public speaking um, in, in the general population. Um, but if you look at who comes in for what kinds of phobias, you know, fear of public speaking is not uh, the, the source of a lot of traffic to therapist office. Um, most people who are afraid of public speaking find some way to just make the avoidance work. Mm -hmm. They, they, you know, they, they dodge it. They don't volunteer for it. Sometimes they even pick careers. So um, that's, that's regarded as the most common phobia and yet a relatively small proportion of people seek help for it. Um, what do people seek help most for? Um, uh Highway driving, I would say, is probably, you know, driving in general is, is probably the most numerous in terms of who actually comes into the office look, looking for help with a phobia. Uh, driving because, you know, especially in, in suburban areas, rural areas, gee, if you don't, if you can't drive, you can't go anywhere. <laughs> right. Um, so mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a very common uh, uh, source of request for help. Um, flying, a lot of requests for flying, because again, you know, uh, in a country this large, if you can't fly, you're really, really limited. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm led to believe in, in Europe, you see a lot less, lot fewer requests for flying because the countries are smaller. You can drive across the whole continent. Mm -hmm. um, not, not so here in the States. So th those, those two are, are real big ones. Um, Less frequently, you, you, you know, I'll, I'll see people with animal phobias, uh, dogs, cats, uh, you know, but sometimes very, you know, more obscure ones. So I'll, I'll still see an occasional person with a snake phobia. Um, what else? And, and should, it, should the snake phobia, just to, just to, to piggyback off that, should the snake phobia person if they're not needing to handle snakes, like let's say in a zoo, <laughs> should, is it good to ignore that? Like, can I ignore my phobia of like um, spiders? You know, like is that okay? Uh, yes, and 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 this is why mm -hmm. you know there's so many people who are afraid of public speaking, but they don't seek help. They they find a way to ignore it. Okay. Um. I've... Now you you can do that. Uh, and it's, it's generally going to work. You can go on about your daily business hard, you know, rarely do people come to your home and insist, Cole, come outside and give us a speech. Uh, that's <laughs> not going to happen. If, you know, if you, you get into a line of work where it's not required. Uh, okay. Um, you know, where it turns out badly, you know, the unfortunate situations, you, know, you meet somebody who, uh, literally makes all their life choices based on, how can I make sure I never have to give a presentation? You know, I've met, uh, you know, clients, guys, guys who became linemen, you know, for the, the phone company, for the electric company, because they knew, well, I'll be up there on top of the pole most of the day and nobody's ever going to want to talk to me. Um, oh, my goodness. That, I never thought that, of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that's mm -hmm. where it starts to become tragic rather than, than functional, yeah, that people right. give up a lot of the choices and opportunities they have in life. Um, with, with respect to animals, you, you know, one of the things about having a fear when, you, when you're afraid of something, it seems like it's everywhere. Uh, and so somebody, you know, who, who in Chicago has trouble with the snake phobia? Uh, well, <laughs> well if, the on, if the only time you'd be afraid is to move over to you, um, probably not too many people, but uh, people develop such a fear that they'll walk into a poorly lit room and there'll be a vacuum cleaner hose on the floor uh, and they'll shriek and run out of the room because they thought they saw a snake. Mm. Uh, somebody that uh, starts to feel embarrassed about that and, and ashamed of that. And, and if they have young children, when the kids get old enough to notice, you know, why is daddy screaming and running down the hall? That's somebody that's going to want to figure out, hey, what do I do about this, this absurdly mm -hmm. exaggerated snake phobia such that I yell when I see a, a vacuum hose? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been able to avoid my avoid running into snakes. I'm, I'm fortunate we live in an area <laughs> that I don't see snakes on a, on a regular basis, so I don't have to worry about encountering them. But my fear of snakes is probably up there. It's pretty high up there with my fear of snakes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the, the other part of the, you know, the definition of a phobia, an irrational fear 
that strongly interferes with your daily activities. Uh, so if you have the fear, but no interference, mm -hmm. oh, well, let's just never move to Arizona. Right. I, I would say it might uh, be yeah. a little bit different for me if I lived in a state that I had to worry about coming across a snake on a daily basis. But here, mm -hmm. yes. my chance of seeing one is only if I go to the zoo and go into the reptile house. <laughs> and right. behind glass. Yes, absolutely. Right. <laughs> and, and then sometimes people's lives change. A lot of the people who, who I see for fear of flying, they often come in when uh, something has happened in their professional life. They've managed to avoid flying for a long time. And, and now they've succeeded to the point where they're getting promotions. Uh, people want them, you know, want to hire them to have more responsibility. And this involves travel uh, or, or public speaking. When, when people often come in for fear of public speaking, they've, they've been afraid of public speaking all their lives. Uh, they come in when their career succeeds to the point that now um, people are making demands. We would like you to come in and present to this. We want to hear your knowledge. Mm -hmm. We admire your skill. You know, when they've succeeded to the point that people want to hear about their expertise, that's when the, the public speaking phobia starts to become unsustainable. Uh, so that that's there's a little irony in there that uh, they've, they've succeeded to the point that now the phobia is worse. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. They've yeah. done the opposite of the guy working at the top of the uh, the line pole. Absolutely. Um, now, right. now, now they're in the public arena and, and people want to hear from them. Yes, ab absolutely. The other piece yeah. about, just to add this, um, is that what's not available to them, you, you might suppose, well, why don't they just tell people, you know what? I'm afraid of public speaking. I, I'm sorry. I, I don't want to do that. I'll, I'll write you a memo. I'll, I'll gladly, or maybe I'll record something, but I'm afraid of public speaking. So don't ask me to come and present at the meeting. I'm not going to do it. Um, if they felt okay about doing that, fear of public speaking wouldn't be much of an issue. Uh, however, most people who have some kind of a phobia also feel ashamed and different mm -hmm. and and so they keep it a secret uh, and and because they feel uh, ashamed and because they they feel they need to rely on a secret that deprives them of the one tool that they might use oh this really scares me i don't want to do it uh, and so they have to make excuses they have to hide they have to do all kinds of stuff because uh, they keep their phobia their fears such a secret that's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Dave, you mentioned earlier with like with the treatment of OCD, you mentioned exposure response prevention therapy. <clears throat> you touched briefly on um, cognitive behavioral therapy and CBT when you were talking about some of your previous experiences. What um, theoretical approach do you tend to take for your work? Well, you know, I, I think I think of my work largely as, as I, I usually describe it as an acceptance-based therapy, um, with a nod towards you know uh, methods like acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, and, and by acceptance-based therapy, I mean uh, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm, I'm going to let myself become afraid. I'm going to give up the safety behaviors of trying to stop myself from feeling afraid. I'm, I'm going to uh, engage in some self-disclosure and, and uh, talk some about my fears rather than, than try and keep it a secret. Um, if, it's, if it's snakes, if it's public speaking, if it's flying, if it's whatever, um, I'm going to show up. I'm going to allow myself to get afraid and I'm going to stay in the situation or the activity uh, until it begins to subside. Um, the acceptance part is real important. Uh, it's not just accepting the situation or the activity, but also the fact that I am afraid. And, and uh, in, in, in our society, it's very unpopular to be afraid. And then people feel ashamed and, and resistant towards it. So that, that's part of the leading edge of, of acceptance-based treatment. So, you know, it's okay to be afraid and I'm going to let myself be afraid. Uh, that that's that that's the core of, of uh, the work that I do, and and the the other the other important ingredient, and and this one I can't really pigeonhole in, 
anybody else's kind of methodology. Um, I, I tend to want to help people figure out that their anxiety is a trick. Uh, how that, so? How, so? How, how, how would you explain that? <clears throat> um, that it, it predicts danger when most likely there's only going to be discomfort. Mm. And, and that, that's the trick. It, it, uh, I, I treat my anxiety a, as a form of danger uh, when it's probably just discomfort. Um, and, 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 you know, the, the little through line, the, the kind of elevator speech I, I, I kind of have for myself in my practice is this. Uh, I work with people uh, who have fears of stuff that tend not to happen. Uh, that, that's an anxiety disorder. Um, fears of stuff that tends not to happen. That my thoughts tell me it's going to happen. My experience shows me that it doesn't. Uh, so that that's the trick that that's an essential core because uh, w when people treat their anxiety as a sign of danger, uh, well, what do we have for danger? We've got fight, flight, and freeze. Um, and that's all that's great. If there's danger, you know, if we have an enemy, uh, we're either going to fight off that enemy or we're going to run away from that enemy. That's all we got for enemies, fight and run away. For discomfort, for me having the thought, Oh gosh, I'm afraid I'm going to get on that airplane and make a fool of myself. Uh, oh no, I'm, I'm going to uh, check into a hotel and when I go to the elevator, I'm going to start screaming because I can't ride in the elevator. Um, people generally predict stuff that, that doesn't happen, that, that hasn't happened. They, they get real nervous and afraid, but they take that as, as a sign of disaster. So that, that, that's the, the, the trick of an anxiety disorder. Somebody with panic disorder uh, they're filled with thoughts that, oh, no, if I experience this, I'm going to uh, go crazy. I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to have a heart attack. I'm going to, uh, you know, make a terrible display of myself in public. But, you know, panic disorder is not, you know, that's why we call it panic disorder. It's not death disorder. It's not insanity disorder. It's not losing control of myself disorder. It's panic disorder. I get more afraid than the situation warrants. Mm -hmm. So I love that. that. That's, I what, love that's, that. What the, that's what the trick is about. And you give more options then to what to do with that discomfort versus the three options that we're given when we have danger and we, yes. and, you, know, right. you know what I mean? So we have a yes. plethora of, of, of options at that point. Uh, also, yeah, it, it opens up a, skills. <laughs> yeah. it opens up a whole world. Uh, whereas before they thought they had to fight it off or run away from it. And then both of those are losers. You know, trying to fight mm -hmm. your anxiety, trying to run away from it. Uh, that, that, that's what leads people to get more and more dysfunctional. You know, Dave, we have a couple of more listener questions that I want to get through. Um, just, mm -hmm. uh, sure. One of them is, um, one of the questions that a listener had uh, sent to us was, I pull my hair out when I get nervous and I started to get a bald spot. What is wrong with me and what should I do? And, and this question actually is really timely because we just had the Oscars. And in addition to many things that happened at the Oscars, one of the things that the one of the co-hosts had reported earlier, Amy Schumer, was that she suffers from this issue, which we mm -hmm. call trich trichotillomania. Mm -hmm. So can you talk right. a little bit about, about that? Yeah, th this is um, listed now in, in the diagnostic manual uh, in the category of, I think they call them... Uh, uh, re repetitive bodily disorders. I don't have mm -hmm. that quite right, um, but it, it, it's, <clears throat> it's part of us got a separate category. Uh, re repetitive behaviors: uh, nail biting, skin picking, pulling hair. Um, there, there's a variety of, of conditions like that, um, and and so what what do we know about it? Uh, well, basically, we know that that that, that some people uh, when they feel anxious, when they feel some other internal sensation, maybe restless or bored or, or whatever, um, uh, tend to start picking their hair, um, maybe as a way of self-soothing, maybe as a way of self-stimulation. Uh, it, it probably has a variety of pathways, but bottom line, uh, they pull their hair and then they they have a bald spot or they have no eyebrows left and they be, feel really ashamed of that and they have something to hide and, and they, they try harder to 
hide this and not do it. And, and with all the anxiety disorders, the harder you try, the worse it gets. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and mm -hmm. so pretty soon they, they find, gee, now I have a spot. Now I have a bigger spot. Um, and, and hard as they, they try to stop doing that, uh, they, they, they find that it, it keeps happening. Um, so that, that's, that would be trichotillomania or, you know, nail biting works the same way. Skin picking works the same way. Um, <clears throat> um, version of, of exposure and re response prevention here is, uh, you know, something called habit reversal. Um, and here I, I, I want to spend a little time as a client or as the therapist working with the client uh, I, I want to become really aware of, of the steps that I go through uh, in order to, to pick my hair, say, or to, to bite my nails um, and find some incompatible response. Uh, so uh, well, by incompatible response, um, uh, this is what I like to do with, with, with hair pulling. This is a real good in, incompatible response. Um, we're going to have a no fly zone for your hands. <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want you to cultivate uh, an awareness of where your hands are, um, particularly when you're in uh, what I'll call the target situations. You know, somebody with trichotillomania um, by uh, spending a week or two with, with some forms, filling out, you know, making journals of when they pick and where they pick and how much they pick and so on. Um, we'll probably see some some patterns. Uh, I, I tend to do the hair picking in, in a, a certain mood or during a certain activity, maybe when I'm studying, maybe when I'm watching television, something that's not so interesting. Uh, I tend not to do it, say, when I'm talking with other people. I tend not to do it, this or that activity. So I can identify, here, here's the situations where I'm most at risk for picking my hair. Uh, and it's to those that then I encourage people to cultivate this awareness of where are my hands. And when my hands start getting up uh, to the, the target range, depending on what they're picking, their you know, eyebrows, scalp, um, well, then I'm, I'm going to bring my hands down and I'm going to hold on to an object for a couple of minutes, uh, a big enough object that I can't pick uh, my hair while I'm holding that object. Um, and then after five or 10 minutes, I'll relax that. I'll put the object down, but I'm going to continue to monitor the no-fly zone. If my hands start coming up above my chin again, whoops, time. okay, go pick up your object. Uh, and in this way, train myself to keep my hands in a location and an activity that uh, just plain makes it really hard to pick. Um, that, that, would, that would be... Uh, you know, the, the reversing the response. So I want to um, engage in a competing behavior that doesn't allow me to pick. And I want to cultivate an accepting attitude towards the urge to pick. This, this is where people, you know, usually have trouble. I think they have to fight the urge. Uh, mm -hmm. They get mad at themselves for having the urge. Uh, mm -hmm. I shouldn't have that thought. What is wrong with me? They denigrate themselves. Um, it's okay to have the urge. Uh, we all have, you know, we all have goofy thoughts and this is one of mine. I'm not going to get into a fight with the urge. Uh, however, I'm going to use no fly zone so I don't act on the urge. It's okay to have the urge. We don't control our thoughts. We all have some goofy thoughts and we want to cultivate an accepting attitude towards those thoughts. We just find, find a way to not act on them. So that, that like would that. be an approach to yeah. trichotillomania. Uh, acceptance and commitment therapy has some, has some really nice models for working with trichotillomania. And actually, Jennifer has been trying to push me to acceptance and commitment therapy. <laughs> now, I think, I think I'm going gonna, gonna to have to uh, do my homework more. Oh. Yes. Yeah, yeah I, right, I, Jennifer, you were right. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, mm -hmm. boy, some wonderful, uh, you know, the last 10, 15 years, acceptance mm -hmm. and commitment therapy has really blossomed. I, I really like their approach. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, another listener question that we have is, should I take <laughs> anti-anxiety medications instead of th talk therapy to deal with my constant <clears throat> feelings of anxiety? 
Well, that's a good question because I have a lot of people that would prefer their Xanax than to come to talk mm-hmm. to me. And I, I would love to hear what you think about that, Dave. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> just want to clarify what we mean by talk therapy. Um, I, I, I think if your only choices were medication and talk therapy, uh, gosh, I'd think that was a terrible choice. Um, <laughs> so I, I want to distinguish, you know, uh, cognitive behavioral treatment, acceptance and commitment therapy, therapy that involves uh, active doing where, where there, there's, there's regular homework and activities outside of, of the session uh, or the, the session is principally a, a planning and staging ground for what you're going to do differently outside. Usually, at least historically, when people say talk therapy, they don't necessarily include that kind of work. Um, so just, just to clarify. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but so the question was about medications. You know, th- there's two classes, general classes of medications that are treated uh, widely for anxiety disorders. The quick-acting benzodiazepines, the tra- you know, you could think of them as tranquilizers. They act real quickly, uh, and you know, after a few hours, the, the results fade, um, and they tend to be generally pretty addictive. Um, those medications are, are probably the, well, what professionals regard as the poorest choice because of the addictive properties and because they lend themselves to, we'll take it when you need it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you take it when you need it. <clears throat> the, the medication uh, becomes another, I don't know if I use this term yet, safety object. No, um, you haven't, but it's true, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. well, safety object. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm, I'm, af- I'm afraid of driving, uh, uh, so I, I can go further if I have my cell phone with me uh you know 10 20 years ago not everybody had a cell phone all the time Mm -hmm. cell phones were here's how i can get help if i need it and and what kind of help did somebody think they needed when they were having a panic attack it wasn't even so much they were going to call and say please come and rescue me they were likely to call a friend and just chat them up for a while to distract themselves from the panic attack and so they tended to think if I have a cell phone, the cell phone protects me. If I don't have my cell phone, I'm vulnerable. Uh, So their reliance on that object led them to think of themselves as more vulnerable than they were. Uh, Or maybe they'd have what they call the support person. Um, I can go and shop in the crowded supermarket as as long as Harry is with me. Uh, Well, so what makes shopping possible? It's Harry, Harry gets the credit. I'm weak and vulnerable. Harry is strong enough that his aura projects something. Uh, mm-hmm. So the, the problem with safety objects, people, and, and there are millions of them, uh, emotional support animals fall into this category. Mm-hmm. Uh, water bottles, all kinds of snack foods, pictures of the grandkids, uh, all kinds <laughs> of stuff people take with them mm-hmm. that tells them, mm, you're going to be able to do it. But they give all the credit to the object and they, they start to feel weaker and more dependent over time rather than less. So it, it seems like a good thing. It's a bad thing. Um, and I think medications, particularly the, the short term uh, benzodiazepines, the Xanax, the Valium, the Clonopin, uh, fall into that category. They, these seem like bodyguards and people become uh, not just physically addicted to them, perhaps, but uh, emotionally dependent on them. This is what makes it possible for me to shop uh, or drive or whatever. So um, I'm, I'm with the psychiatrists on this one. I, I don't like to see people come to rely on, on those short-term medications. Um, it, it's, it's not a good course long-term. If you have yeah, to fly once you. a year yeah. and you take a Xanax, probably not so bad. But if you're doing this with any regularity, Mm-hmm. Um, you're, you're going to be psych- psychologically dependent on it, if nothing else. And, and people tend to feel weaker and more dependent over time rather than getting that recovery that they were open for. Yeah. And the clients that I've um, seen that have been long term <clears throat> use on benzodiazepines, it's been very difficult to get them off of it. It's just, it's, it's been a painful <clears throat> time. 
Sure, sure. Because at that point, it seems like you know, aside from the the, the physiological aspect, uh, th this is this is uh, this this is my rescue. This is my protector. I, I feel mm -hmm. so vulnerable if I let it go. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, with respect to those medications, uh, I, I, I think a uh, some form of a behavioral therapy, a cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment therapy, um, it's going to work slower than the medications, but it's going to help you preserve uh, and expand, you know, your your independence as a person. And that, that, that's really the trade off. Dave, what, what do you like most about your work, just in general? Um, people get better. Uh, I, I see people get better, you know, sometimes in, in a remarkably short period of time. And, and it's, uh, it's such a wonder. It's so, it's so exciting for them. Um, it, it's really something to see somebody come five years or seven years. They've just about given up hope that they can ever function independently, and and they they throw it off, and then they throw it off sometimes in a remarkably short period of time. I I love seeing that happen, um, and and the 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 process by by which we do this uh, is a, a pretty active, uh, interactive kind of process. The client ends up laughing a lot, uh, you know, which which is terrific. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I uh, it, it, it's, it's an enjoyable path to help people really get something that they they wanted and they they were afraid they were never going to get. Um, that's probably the best way I can describe it. Uh, and I, I think you know, it, uh, going going back to those days when when they told me, "Oh, you're pretty good at this. You're not so good at that." <laughs> Um, I, I think, you know, they were probably right that that reflects something <laughs> about, you know, my personality, you know, what I'm good at, and what I'm not good at. And, mm -hmm. and, and so I, I enjoy being good at something, too. Yeah, absolutely. And you get to make them laugh, even if it That's even right. if you didn't take the comedian route. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, well, I, well I, here's I, the thing. Did, but did you? Did you uh, <laughs> I, I managed. About, uh, <laughs> yeah. Dave, do you want I, to share that with everyone? I mean, the other uh, things of what you like to do or you don't have to. Sure. No, no, no. Try and stop me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I did finally uh, get some of the, the comedian thing. Um, gosh, we're in our 10th year now. Um, I, I formed a, an improvisational comedy troupe of, of professional psychotherapists. Uh, and we're the therapy players and we play a variety of clubs. And, and theaters and stuff around Chicago, and we play all the, the big mental health conferences that come here as well. Um, uh, I, 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 it turns out I didn't have to choose one or the other. I've been able to combine them. Absolutely. And actually, <laughs> now that you mentioned that, I, do, I, I believe I've seen you guys perform. <laughs> You have? Oh, cool. Yes. I, I never got tickets because they're always sold out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, when, when is this going to be broadcast? Uh, probably tomorrow. <laughs> oh, if I, if okay. If I get my well, act together. <laughs> well, Saturday, April 2nd, we're playing the Skokie Theater. Okay, that's oh this goodness. Saturday. I will, definitely, yeah. I will definitely put uh, that on the social media. That's amazing. Yeah, okay. is, it, do, is there still tickets available? Well, that theater is so big, we've never managed to sell it out. Uh, it's like 140 seats. So uh, lots of other places we sell out. We've never sold out Skokie. Uh, so here's a challenge a to you goal. listeners. Come on, come on <laughs> <Yes>. out. <laughs> see if you can, see if you can buy every ticket. Sell it out. I love that. I love that. Yeah, but it, it's, it's a great deal of fun. Um, we, we all have a good time doing that. And the, you know, the other way I, I feel like I've sort of, you know, rounded the, uh, the, the corner there with humor is, um, I've just found lots of ways to use humor in, in the treatment of anxiety and, and uh, humor fits so perfectly because, uh, you know, the, the classic psychological understanding of humor is um, that you, you laugh, you have this humorous response when you realize, oh, I was mistaken about how threatening or bad this situation was, that that's how Freud saw humor. 
lot of people see humor. It, it, it's mm -hmm. uh, the enjoyment and the release of energy that comes on realizing, oh, I misunderstood. It's not as bad as I thought. And mm. that's that's anxiety disorders across the board. That, mm -hmm. That's the anxiety trick. I thought it was danger. It turns out to just be discomfort. Um, yeah. So humor is, is a powerful, powerful way for people to uh, find ways to cut those fears down to size. Absolutely. So that, that's, that's the best of both worlds for me. It is. It is. You found a way to combine the two. <laughs> I did. Yeah. It took me 70 years, but I got there. <laughs> you made the most of your, of those career quizzes and <clears throat> yeah, that's evaluate. right. Yeah. You made the most of yours. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Whoever wrote what color is your parachute? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. So we, um, Dave, when we, all of the guests that we have who come on the, we kind of, we'll ask this question of all of them. And what is something that you wish people knew about either your work, you knew they knew about anxiety, they knew about the field of, of psychology that you would like to impart on them. Um, or demystify, or demystify, yes. right? Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I guess, you know, about my work and in particular and, and about working with anxiety disorders in general, um, there, there's still so much room for, for people to recognize in general, uh, one, how, how common and ordinary these problems are, uh, and, and two, how solvable they are. Um, and, and particularly the last part, because uh, you know, while we can find the, the funniness and the fears and, and see how it works, um, still people experience enormous despair about them. Uh, and, and, and that's, that's the piece, you know, that, that we still need so much of for people to come to be able to see and discover even, you know, when I feel like, you know, I, God, I've tried so hard, and, you know, five years, 10 years, 15 years, I haven't been able to solve this problem. Um, that doesn't at all indicate it's not solvable, uh, because with the anxiety disorders, um, it's people's resistance, it's people's opposition to the fear that, that keeps it going. And, and when we can help you turn that around, uh, recovery can come very quickly. Um, you know, people often come in and, and see me for a session or two and then say something like, uh, you know, d despite all my best efforts, this, this fear keeps getting worse. Despite my best efforts, the fear keeps getting worse. And that's heartfelt and sincere, but there's something that, that's incorrect about that, that, that's untrue, and I'm going to help them discover it. It, it. It's not despite their best efforts that it's getting worse. It's literally because of their best efforts that it's getting worse, because their best efforts are being uh, played out in the service of avoiding and fighting and resisting and distracting. And that's what's making it worse. And when I can help them turn that around, into some accepting approach to the fear rather than fighting and resisting and avoiding, that's when they, they can make such rapid progress. Uh, so that, that, that the difference between those two phrases, despite my best fears and because of my best fears, uh, best, best responses, that, that, that sums it up. So what, what do I hope, wish people could learn um, that these, these are common and treatable and, and you know, any, anybody that despairs of getting over this it's got you depressed. That's understandable. It's been a monkey on your back. That doesn't mean it's not, not solvable. Thank you so much, Dave, for all your time, uh, your, your words of uh, your wise words and, and, and your wisdom and, and spending this hour with us. Um, thank you very much. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. So just to wrap up, for more information on Dr. Dave Carbonell and his work, you can find him at his website, being anxietycoach.com, or as he just told us on April 2nd at the Spokane Theater performing with the <laughs> therapy players. Come up and love. say hello. <laughs> and in addition, um, I know that your second edition of the Panic Attacks Workbooks was just recently released this month, correct? Yeah, yeah. This week, two days ago, I think. Wonderful. Um, so, so can we pick that up on Amazon, on Amazon or on your website? Uh, wherever fine books are sold. Wonderful. Yeah, well, to our listeners, right next to the fine books. But you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll find it there. To our listeners, thank you for listening. And as always, subscribe to the Everything You Want to Know About Therapy, But We're Too Afraid to Ask podcast everywhere you listen to good podcasts. And give us a five-star review. Also, follow us on Instagram and at therapy underscore podcast underscore for updates, additional information, and message us to topics and questions you always want to know about but we're too afraid to ask. I will be posting all the information about Dr. Carbonell's work, um, including his therapy players um, comedy show coming up on uh, our Instagram account. Thank you so much, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening. And we hope you enjoyed this podcast. Don't forget to subscribe to us wherever you listen to good podcasts and keep up with episode updates on Instagram. Follow us at therapy underscore podcast underscore. You can send us messages on topics you'd like to hear or anything that comes to mind. Bye for now.